You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. We've spent the past episodes considering the upside down kingdom, the kingdom of God. In today's episode, we look at some of the highlights of these past episodes and respond to questions that have come up within our community that have to do with the upside down kingdom. So we have been talking over the last few weeks about the upside down kingdom. And so if you've been around for one of our Q&Rs before, just spend the first few minutes just going over some of the high points of of the last few weeks. And like I said, that QR code is live and you can um, anonymously ask questions uh, along the way. So um, feel free to do that. And like I said, we, we, we call it Q&R, question and response, rather than question and answer, because um, knowing that uh, there's probably a whole lot more of an answer uh, to some of the questions that people might ask. Um, so we'll just call them responses for now. And if they're not as complete as people would like, then again, hopefully we'll be able to have a more complete uh, answer in the days to come. We started out the series looking at this idea that we are kingdom people. And throughout the series, we reminded ourselves of the fact that we're people of the kingdom, but we live in the world. And that that's where a major tension comes from for us as, as believers in Jesus, that um, we're, we're part of two places in some ways. We've got our foot in one place, and yet we're still part of another. And um, the, the language that theologians use that Paul sort of alludes to in his letters in the New Testament is this idea that the kingdom of God is a now and not yet. And not just Paul, but I think Paul really gets that that idea from Jesus because throughout the Gospels, as Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, he he talks about how the kingdom of God is like, and um, he refers to the kingdom of God being here. But But we know that it... Yes, a part of it is here, but a part of it is also coming. And so that plays into that same tension that as kingdom people uh, living in this world, we know that the kingdom of God has come, but the kingdom of God also will come. We talked about what a king should look like and um, that uh, there are certain characteristics uh, that that the Lord specifically said to Israel when they were talking about kings and saying that that's not even just specific to kings. Obviously, contextually, we in the United States are not uh, a kingdom. Um, We're a republic, a a democratic republic, right? And so uh, it's not a a one-for-one comparison there, but when it comes to characteristics, these are characteristics to be thoughtful of a king that that the Lord chooses, not overly wealthy, following God's laws, and also humble, and seeking out upside-down kingdom values. Like so many things in life, uh, it's hard to bat a thousand, I guess, right? And so as we think about characteristics of of leaders, um, characteristics even of ourselves, as we Uh, fulfill leadership positions? Are we being thoughtful of how we're doing that? Are we um, seeking kingdom values and trying to uh, show those kingdom values as well? And then we also said, again, contextually for us living in the United States, that a president is, is not a king and the United States is not Israel. But these characteristics should be looked for in any leader. Uh, That's an easy translation for us to say that no, we don't have a king, but we can uh, look for these values and these characteristics in anybody who's a leader, whether they're a king or a president or governor, uh, a principal or whatever it might be. Um, We talked about peace and war in the kingdom. Even asking ourselves this question of, Is it possible that sometimes we move too quickly to war and violence to achieve peace? It seems like that is somewhat of an 
an embraced value in our, not just in our culture, but in our world, that uh, ironically, in order to achieve peace, violence is the preferred method. Um, looked at people like Martin Luther King Jr., who really spearheaded a, a more peaceful approach towards, uh, um, and nonviolent approach towards um, seeking out peace in, in the civil rights movement. We talked about the the shalom of God, which oftentimes when we read in Hebrew the word shalom, it's just translated simply peace, but it's so much more than that. Um, It's it's a contentment. It's it's a contentedness as well. And so are we really looking for peace and where are we looking for peace? And, And then the idea that peace doesn't come through rebellion, it comes through surrender and sacrifice. You know, Jesus, the the Prince of Peace, came and he brought peace with him. And with that peace, how how did he achieve that? He achieved that through surrendering and sacrifice. He surrendered to the will of the Father and he sacrificed himself on the cross for us. And so real, true peace, the shalom of God, can only be achieved through, through Christ. And if we try to find it elsewhere, it will come up short. Uh, Any time that we're looking uh, for something outside of, of God, um, we're always going to find that it comes up short. And then we talked about poverty and wealth in the kingdom. Uh, this idea that we should be content with enough. Again, I think in our culture, um, I mean, I caught myself the other day is, is Christmas is coming and all these, this is Black Friday week. Now we have a whole week of Black Friday, right? So I'm seeing all these deals and I'm going, oh, look, I'm going to put that on my wish. And I feel like I'm like six years old again because I'm putting these things on my wish list. But then I have to remind myself of contentment. Like, am I, am I being content and what is enough? And not just materially, but um, we have this tendency at times to say that we need to be enough. And so ask the question, do you feel like you need to be enough or is God enough for you? Uh, Those moments in our lives, which I would imagine all of us face, where we're asking ourselves, am I enough? And I think the next logical question is, can I ever be enough? And the question is no, because that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus, because Jesus is enough. And while that sounds a little cliche at times, we we have to embrace the enoughness of Jesus, um, because we fall short. And when we do, uh, just like Paul understood, that his grace is sufficient for us, even when we don't feel like we are enough or we have enough. Um, and so, our, where is it that we are looking for our enough? Are we looking past Jesus, or is it Jesus plus? Are we saying, okay, well, I can be content with Jesus, but I also need to have other things. Um, and, you know, use the illustration of having gone down to Costa Rica and seen people who had very, very little, especially in comparison to many of us, who seem to have a joy that you don't often find in the suburbs um, and even in the United States. Power, when we talked about power in the kingdom, and uh, especially in political times, we see people who we would consider to be power seekers. And as a skeptic myself, asking myself that question of why are power seekers seeking power? (laughs) Usually it's not for as um, uh, benevolent and altruistic of means as we would like them to. Um, That oftentimes uh, they're doing it um, for other reasons. We we, for comic book fans, we use the, the words of, of Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, who said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, that there is a responsibility any time that we assume a position of power. Um, we looked at the biblical character of Rehoboam, who is the grandson of David, who, uh, instead of listening to his Uh, Father Solomon's advisors, he decided to listen to all his peers, which is probably 
not a good thing all the time, and decided that he was going to oppress his people more. And so power really corrupted him in so many ways, but we don't look to kings and and kings of this world to understand power or to even model power for us, but we look to Jesus to be the one to remind us. And we looked at Andy Crouch, who's written the book called Strong and Weak, and he said the possibility that the journey of Christian discipleship and true power would involve not just a progression towards one or the other, authority or vulnerability, but towards both at the same time, because we see that Jesus modeled for us a position and a posture of authority and vulnerability. He knew that he had been given authority by the Father, but he also knew that he needed to model that in a vulnerable way. And I think one of the greatest examples of that that he did was the night before uh, he would give himself up, he washed the feet of the disciples. Um, and many of whom, I mean, Peter, of course, you know, the one who generally ends up jumping to conclusions anyway, was like, no, Lord, if you're going to wash my feet, just wash my whole body. And and it was just another case of missing the point for, for Peter. But <clears throat> Jesus modeled vulnerability, uh, and he didn't uh, take it for granted, the fact that he was given the authority of the Father. And we looked at the words that Jesus quoted from Isaiah when he went into the synagogue and he un- unfurled the, the scroll to read from Isaiah in Luke 4. And he gave, again, an example of how we wield power. How do we wield power? We proclaim good news to the poor. We proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the captives. We proclaim recovery of sight for the blind, not just physically blind, but spiritually blind as well. We set the oppressed free, and then we proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the the year of jubilee as it was called in the old testament every 50 years that year would come and and land that had been had fallen away from a family or had to be sold or whatever was returned in that year of jubilee and the land was given a rest and the people were given a rest and part of our responsibility in given the power and authority of god is that we proclaim that freedom. We proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We said that God is our king and that sometimes we need to experience the hard stuff before we can experience the best stuff. Um, That we need to acknowledge that God is sovereign over all things, but uh, it doesn't always uh, feel great uh, in his sovereignty that things can be a challenge at times. But in God, the kingship of God, we see the opposite of the kingship of the kings of this world. That God does the opposite of what earthly kings do. Instead of taking, he gives, even to the point of giving his one and only son for us. And instead of being the one that causes people to cry out in relief, he is the one to whom we cry for relief in the midst of stuff. And again, uh, we saw that with Rehoboam who uh, made his people cry out for relief from his own actions. Uh, But God doesn't do that. He is the one, as we see David crying out throughout the Psalms, to whom we cry out. And then last week as we were coming to the end, we we talked about the return of the king and we talked about hope and where our hope derives from what we take with us, what we have inside of us, and what our destination are make a significant difference in how we will travel. We looked at uh, the story of, you know, Tolkien's story of the, the Lord of the Rings and how that group was put together and the big difference in how they set their sights on something, especially towards the end as it was just Sam and Frodo together and how Frodo was laser focused on on making sure that Frodo was protected. But um, in, a, in Isaiah 9-2, a verse that we often will pull out, especially at this time of year as we kick off the Advent season next year, 
the words that uh, Isaiah, so that God spoke through Isaiah to the exiles living in Babylon, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And so uh, this, I, I was meeting with, um, <clears throat> I lead a, a group of 10th grade boys on Wednesday mornings in a Bible study, and we've been looking through the Gospel of John, and I was having them dig deep into some of their language arts and English uh, learnings, reminding them of, of motifs that they'll often see in writing. And we see that in the writing of, of John, not only in his gospel, but also in his letters as well. He uses the sy- symbolism of light and darkness, just like we saw in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, but um, contrasting the light of Christ with the darkness of this world. And that's what Isaiah was proclaiming to the people who felt like everything was darkness uh, and reminding them that the light had come, that light was Jesus. So all that being said, I'm I'm not seeing any questions up here. (laughs) That either means everyone's disinterested or it means that I, I answered them all while I covered everything. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, as we were getting ready to dive into this, I I knew over the summer that obviously we were coming up into an election season and that um, if 2020 was any indication of what we might experience, then we may have to brace ourselves for uh, the tumult that would come. And as I just prayed about, you know, God, where are we supposed to be focused as not just as a a local church, but as people of the kingdom, um, I just kept coming back to that as a reminder that um, it's really easy for us, at least it's easy for me, to get so, you know, myopic and, and only see what's right in front of me. And, you know, it was my oldest... Uh, first time uh, voting this year, and I felt like we needed to do something more <laughs> when when I drove him up to um, to vote early with me. <clears throat> but um, but then I again reminded myself that it, you know we go through this process every four years as as a country, and um, we put so much stock in it. And not to say that it's not significant or important, um, but we also know that um, things change over time. And for those of us who are followers of Christ, even more so, that reminder that um, we are people of the kingdom living in this world, and that, uh, yes, presidents may come and go, governors may come and go, congressmen, senators, all those um, people together, but God is still in control, um, and he's not surprised by anything. Um, and you know, there are days that I need to remind more reminders of that than other days um, to say, okay, um, that didn't go the way that I thought it should or would. Um, so what do I do with that? Um, and it's just it it was troubling to me, and you know, now I feel like the dust is beginning to settle a little bit. But uh, when even Christians were um, on on the wrong side of either celebration or demise, um, because we saw uh, both, I think, and and we probably will continue to see that. But we, if we can't convey the hope of Jesus Christ in the midst of circumstances that are difficult, then what's the purpose of the church? I mean, what's the purpose of Jesus having come um, if we can't really hold on to that truth? Um, Or if our hope is grounded in um, so deeply in fallible people. That, That was Israel's problem, was that they thought that if they looked just like everybody else, uh, if they had a king that could ride out in front of them, 
uh, and protect them and fight for them and do all those things, then uh, they'd be, you know, scot-free. Um, but that wasn't the way that it is. I, I was reminded of a, a verse this week as I was talking with a friend um, in Exodus. I think it was Joshua who God had spoken to. And he said, the Lord will fight for you if you only be still. <laughs> um, and it's like so many verses in the Bible that like if you could cut off a couple of words, it'd be a really good verse. And I'm like, oh, it's a great verse if you say the Lord will fight for you and leave it there. But it's not that. It's the Lord will fight for you if you only be still. I don't know about y'all, but... Um, I have a really hard time being still. Um, and, and then I get in the way of God's fighting for me um, because I think I know better, because I'm too impatient to sit and wait, you know, fill in the blank of, of the why of it. Um, and I just, it's not an easy thing. But, you know, the truth of Scripture, we, we, can't, we can't do a Thomas Jefferson with it right, and cut out the things that we don't like and make our own little John Gibson Bible or whatever. Um, We we have to embrace the whole uh, truth, the whole counsel of God's Word, and even when it's awkward or difficult or challenging or whatever it might be. Um, So, you know, and who knows, maybe four years from now, um, we'll be looking at the kingdom of God again because we all need that reminder again at the next election um, that, hey, you know what? God is in control and he's um, got this. He's got it in his hands and he's far more uh, equipped than we are, right? To, to be able to um, walk through it, so... Uh, any other? I'm still refreshing my thing, and nobody's asking questions. So, any live questions that anyone has? Okay. That, there's a great one. I'm glad someone asked this. Finally, do you have any suggestions for a peaceful holiday with friends and family with regard to political differences? I, I'll. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll give, again, this is a response rather than an answer. Um, I have been incredibly disheartened at some of the approach. I've been disheartened, but I understand um, this approach of, I'm just not going to go be with my family during this time. I, I get it that it's hard, but like, if we run away from every hard thing in life, that's, we're never going to grow. We're, we're never going to be changed and transformed. Um, some people think avoiding, you know, what is it? Avoid religion and politics when you get together with family. Um, I, I don't, um, I don't necessarily think that's always great either. Especially, you know, for those of us who are followers of Christ, um, that guides our lives. And for us to say that that, that doesn't influence everything, uh, then I, that means that we're almost cutting off a piece of ourselves. Here's the other thing. I mean, when it comes to religion and politics, especially religion, I, I, I think it's very interesting that some people um, will say, well, they're not religious people. Everybody is religious and everybody has a God. Whether they admit it or not, whether that's the true God or, or it's themselves or the God of science or the God of politics or whatever, everybody has a God. And so um, even some of the business that we see, you know, is this whole separation of church and state, which I still think is somewhat blown out of proportion and out of context. Um, the fact of the matter is if your God is science, um, you're not leaving that out of the state you're still making decisions based on that God. Um, And so to tell a certain group of people, hey, you need to leave your God aside, 
um, but let others, let their God kind of take full, full uh, steam ahead, then um, I don't know. I just think that's, that's a struggle. So, so I, I mean, I'd say it, my wife has taught me well in saying, ask questions, don't make statements. And so that would be probably one of my greatest recommendations for peaceful times with family is, oh, that's an interesting viewpoint. Can you tell me more about that? You know, why do you see it that way? Um, help me understand that, you know, all the good counseling lingo. Um, and, and then, yeah, don't be, don't provoke, <laughs> which is easier said than done for some of us. Um, someone asked about what the upside down kingdom is. And so the kingdoms of this world are, are the right side up kingdoms. But the kingdom of God is upside down in that it doesn't operate and function. And the values of the upside down kingdom are not the values of the world. I think I said this last week that in reality, the kingdom of God is the right side up kingdom. Um, but And the world is the upside down one. Um, but because many of us look through the lens of the world, we'll, we'll call that the, the right side up kingdom. And the kingdom of God comes in as the upside down kingdom. Um, God's kingdom is on an earth that has physical and environmental dangers. How do we comfort those who fear potential dangers that come with a leadership change? That's a great question. Um, I think, again, listening and acknowledging are two absolutely important things in the midst of this, which we don't do well. I mean, I I will continue to point to social media and our 24-hour news cycle as two of the main culprits for why we don't listen well and why we don't acknowledge things well, because we're getting information at such a breakneck speed that we just don't know what to do with it. Um, if, if anybody uh, can filter through all the information that comes at them on a daily basis, then uh, please tell me your secret because I just don't think um, that we can, maybe I should say, if anyone can adequately filter through uh, all the information that is thrust at them on a daily basis, um, then I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's near impossible. But I think just acknowledging, again, I mean, I, I may have mentioned that I had someone reach out to me um, who I think has very, very different viewpoints than me, um, but somehow or another through social media and other ways felt comfortable to anonymously, you know, and privately meet with me. And I just listened um, and, and I tried to empathize, which empathy is not in my top strength, so it's a stretch at times. Um, and, and do my best. Look, I've got Italian blood. So we just don't keep our mouths shut for very long. I mean, can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, practicing that. And, and honestly, back to that question before, I think, like, sometimes family, as difficult as it can be, can be the safer place to practice that, like, working on, like, keeping your mouth shut um, and asking questions. Um, But when we can let, I have found it incredibly, not just rewarding, but um, when people feel that you've heard them and that you've acknowledged what they've said and they feel understood, doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. when they feel heard and understood, I feel like that makes a huge difference for people because people just don't, we just don't do that well as a society. And so if the church can lead the charge on that and say, hey, I want to be a good listener. <laughs> I want to be a good person to understand and really seek. I, I always use the phrase that um, I used to always listen to respond. It's much better to listen to understand. Um, and if we're listening to respond, then we're probably not listening well um, because we're just waiting to see what we're going to say next. And if you have to use tools in the midst of your conversations, I, 
I, I've said to many a person sitting across the table from me, is it okay if I, if I take notes, um, if I write things down? Because if I, focus is not in my top, five, top strengths either. So if I don't write something down, it's lost. Um, and it's no disrespect for the person to whom I'm speaking, but even just saying, is it okay if I jot some notes down? Um, and because I want to honor you and, and listen uh, to what you're saying. So um, those things would be helpful. Um, if God is in control of everything, is there a point in doing anything? Wow, that's almost nihilistic in some ways. But um, Here's the thing that I, I think we'll all struggle with until we come face to face with God. Humans have free will and God is sovereign. And we try to put those things together and it feels like, you know, just this major tension. Um, God created humanity with the ability to make decisions. That's why we are where we are. That's why Adam and Eve um, made the decision to not listen to what God said and why sin entered into the world. Does that mean God made a mistake? I don't think it does. I think it just means that in order for love to happen, it has to be a choice too. And we, God couldn't just make creatures who automatically loved him and obeyed him. Um, obedience and love are choices. Um, and so I think that um, we're always going to try to wrap our heads around the fact that, well, if God knew that that was going to happen, then did God order and direct? I, there's some semantics that are involved in it, but I'm not always a big fan of people who said, well, God made that happen. Mm. God knew that it would happen, but I think there's a difference between having a knowledge and an understanding of something happen and actually directing that. Uh, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and so I think, yes, there is a point in doing things because we don't know what God is doing beneath the surface. Um, I, I, again, just had a conversation this week with someone about that, this idea that um, I don't know what's going on. I, I mean, I can have conversation after conversation with people and know something, but I'm not going to know everything about what's happening in a person's life. Um, but God does, and, God, and the Holy Spirit sees things that are uh, going on. So, so I'd say, yeah, there is a point and purpose if God is in control of everything. Um, there may be times that we feel like it doesn't make sense, like it's purposeless, but I think there is a point in doing things. Um, I'm going to look at the verse that we read from earlier. Actually, I think it's on my stand. Um, someone's asking about the... That's not my stand. That's yours, Kenny. Someone's asking about the verse from Hebrews that we read from. Um, Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Um, for a God is a consuming fire. So what does that ex actually mean? What is God, you know, what happens when um, fire consumes something? It, it's, it, well, first of all, it, it purifies it, right? Yeah, it takes away the dross if it's a metal um, and removes the impurities. And so in that way, God as a consuming fire is, is refining us and making us um, more like we were intended to be. Um, it sounds, it, yeah, it can sound like, oh, God's just going to burn me up or, you know, whatever. That's, uh, it's not intended to be like harsh, but um, as, mu as much as being consumed uh, can be harsh. Um, I don't think uh, that that's um, really what the writer of the Hebrews is saying, that but, but instead that, yes, we are um, being consumed. And again, that's part of this whole process, um, this living in the world, but being of the kingdom. I think that's part of that consuming fire piece is that God is refining us. Um, and I, again, to me, there's been some postures from 
both sides of the political aisle, from Christians and non-Christians alike in this season um, that are somewhat surprising to me more from the Christian perspective because essentially as Christians, we should be, we are called to be in this process of sanctification, to be being made holy. And if we say, I'm not going to subject myself to the things that God wants me to so that he can make me holy, then we're basically saying what Adam and Eve said, I I know better than you do. And so I'm not going to let you do the work in me that you need to do. Look, trust me. I, I mean, I, all, it, all you need to do is, is have kids and you can realize like how refining that process is um, to me. I don't like to grow. I, I don't like to be wrong. Um, I don't like to say I'm sorry, but that's part of the process of growth. And um, if we truly believe that, that God is refining us, that he's the consuming fire that's changing us to be more like him, then we need to trust him and let him do that work in us. So, um, hey, feel free. This link is going to be open uh, for the next couple of days too. Um, so if something occurs to you later, you can either put it in there in the Slido um, thing online you can send an email to me and and i can respond um i'll probably send out an email too i think i've done this before in the past just compiling all these questions and and putting something on there just so um if if you missed it or want to share that uh, you can do that as well um but um like i said next week is is advent and um I thought it was appropriate that we talked about hope because, again, the <clears throat> the four themes of the four weeks of Advent are, you know, love, joy, peace, and hope. Um, and Advent is a time of preparation, preparing for the the arrival of Christ. But uh, we talk about not just the first advent of Jesus when Jesus came as a baby, but we talk about the second advent of Jesus when Jesus will return, which is what we had talked about last week. And so um, our our hope has to be grounded in that. Um, in both the first advent, the people of the Old Testament, their hope was grounded in the, the first advent of Jesus, and many of them didn't even see it. Um, but uh, for us, as people of the New Testament and beyond, our hope is firmly grounded in the second advent, that Jesus will return again, that the king will be turned uh, right side up, um, and we will um, see God be king over all things. So thanks for um, those questions, and like I said, feel free to send other ones. Let me pray for us, and we'll um, conclude our time together. God, thanks so much for just the ways that you work. Thanks for the ways that you've caused people to thoughtfully process through uh, this information, thoughtfully process through uh, what it means to be people of the kingdom and to, uh, to be living in this world. God, I especially just want to lift up uh, everyone who uh, is going into holiday festivities with anxiety and fear and other things, Um, fearful of the conversations, fearful of anger or sadness or whatever that might rise up in the midst of it. And I pray, God, that you would um, just give people boldness, but give people strength, help people to be able to ask questions that... um, will really not provoke anger or um, anything else, but will just really provoke thoughts in other people. And that, um, that God, there'll be opportunities to say, hey, I, I, I don't fully understand. I don't always like things, but yet my hope isn't in the things of this moment, but things uh, that will come in the future. And so, God, we we thank you for the ways that you work. We thank you that you do hold all things in your hand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are people of the kingdom living in the world, and we carry with us the light and hope of the returning king. This isn't easy or without incident. It can be messy and difficult. It can be awkward at times. 
As Paul described it, the kingdom is a now and a not yet. So let's live out the hope of Christ now with the expectation and hope of the not yet coming one day in the future. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.